This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Instead of another New Year's resolution, why not truly kickstart your new year and challenge yourself to learn something new with a free 10-day trial to lynda.com? lynda.com is used by millions of people around the world and has over 3,000 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design, and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress, yay, and Photoshop. All of their courses are taught by experts, and new courses are added each week to the site. So, whether you want to set new financial goals, find that work-life balance thing, invest in a new hobby, ask your boss for a raise, I'm going after that one, find a new job, or improve upon your current job skills in 2015, lynda.com has something for you and everyone. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can sign up for a free 10-day trial by visiting lynda.com forward slash WWII. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com forward slash WWII. And with that, you'll get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com. And you can view the tutorials on your tablet or your iPhone and Android mobile devices. And of course, as they add new courses each week, you'll get access to those as well. And when you do sign up, here are some courses and videos you might want to try. Getting Things Done by David Allen. This best-selling author shares his tips for being more productive, something we could all use in 2015. There's also Small Business Secrets, Gamification of Learning. I'm looking forward to that one. And Business Writing Fundamentals. Now, me personally, some of the other ones I'm going to be checking out are their audio ones, always trying to take the podcast to the next level, as well as the web production and designing, so I don't have to bug my web tech guy at 2 o'clock in the morning in Scotland. Sorry about that, mate. So, start the new year off right, do something good for yourself in 2015, and sign up for a free 10-day trial to lynda.com. Please go to lynda.com forward slash WWII. Go ahead. I challenge you to learn something new in 2015. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 117, Tobruk and Iraq, or Sand, Sand, and More Sand. Last time, the Axis forces within North Africa, led by General Rommel, had taken as much territory as the British-led forces seemed willing to give, by their incompetence and lack of fire in the belly that had been oh so present during Operation Compass. Besides the area around British-controlled Tobruk, Rommel had captured, or recaptured, his way back east, all the way to Solom just inside the Egyptian border. Yet now he was stymied by Tobruk in mid-April 1941, and so chose to consolidate what he now had in his hands. Yet as the daring young general was about to find out, he was fighting his own war, not Nazi Germany's. He had been sent to North Africa, really, just to bolster their weak and lackluster Italian allies not to start a man- and material-draining new offensive with visions of taking all of the Middle East, just as the real focus of Berlin, of Hitler, was about to start. Namely, Operation Barbarossa, Nazi Germany's invasion of Russia. So, instead of reinforcements of more weapons and supplies, Berlin's attitude to Rommel's requests so he could push his way onto Alexandria could be summed up by a diary entry of General Halder, Chief of Staff at OKH. April 23, 1941. Rommel has not sent in a single clear report, and I have a feeling that things are in a mess. All day long he rushes about between his widely scattered units and stages reconnaissance raids, in which he fritters away his strength. Air transport cannot meet his senseless demands. It is essential to have the situation cleared up without delay. And dovetailing nicely into this situation, but in a bad way for Rommel, was Churchill's attitude. 
Just because C&C Wavell's worst-case scenario, written up in 1940, was coming true, the potential loss of Egypt, the Germans winning in Greece, and a rebellion in Iraq, that was no reason to be downhearted. If anything, to Winston's mind, the collapsing situation should spur the men on to their greatest efforts yet. So, when General John Kennedy, Director of Military Operations, suggested over dinner that the Middle East seemed about to become untenable, Churchill exploded. Wavell has 400,000 men. If they lose Egypt, blood will flow. I will have firing parties to shoot the generals. To which Kennedy rejoined something along the lines of, Oh, they will fight, the men and the generals. The question is, how many men are we willing to lose to keep Egypt and the Middle East? And it's a good thing that Wavell has already worked out a withdrawal plan. To this, Churchill jumped up, I'm guessing about five feet into the air. This comes as a flash of lightning to me. War is a contest of wills. It is pure defeatism to speak as you have done. And Winston was about to put pay to his words. Not the shooting everyone part, but the contest of wills. At the time, British war policy, as touching the Middle East, was threefold. Disrupting Rommel's supply line through the Mediterranean to their greatest degree, giving the C&C Middle East everything they possibly could, so he could deal with the numerous and far-ranging threats to the areas under his control. And lastly, quite simply, beating the life out of the Axis forces in North Africa, which would make most of the other threats in the area fade into the shadows. Now, Churchill could give the Navy all he could to deal with the battle of controlling the waterways of the Mediterranean. He could give Wavell all the planes, tanks, guns, and men he could to check Rommel. But he couldn't fight their battles for them as much as he may have wanted to. And this is what bothered him the most. Besides, the Navy had already attempted to deal in shenanigans and not just brute force in their cause. An idea had been floated about, no pun intended, to sink an old battleship at the entrance of Tripoli's harbor. But German air power in the area was such that the Admiralty knew the ship would never get through. Wavell wanted to have bombs dropped on Tripoli more nights than not, as a way to stymie Rommel. But there weren't enough bombers for that, as Churchill had insisted that Germany proper be bombed nightly throughout 1941. This wasn't going to win the war, but it certainly delivered some payback for the German bombers coming over since the Battle of Britain. Besides which, as Bomber Command had to learn the ropes of nighttime bombing, they had suffered many losses during the latter half of 1940. No, there just weren't that many bombers and support crews to give London and Wavell enough for what they needed. All this added up to Tripoli was to be menaced by only six Wellington bombers, based at Malta, as well as a destroyer raider force commanded by Captain Mack. Of course, these paltry forces didn't excuse anyone, to Churchill's point of view, from his desire to see that no supplies reached Rommel. A Whitehall directive of April 14th read, Every convoy which gets through must be considered a serious naval failure. The reputation of the Royal Navy is engaged in stopping this traffic. But Admiral Cunningham, in overall command of the naval forces within the Mediterranean, knew that those bombers and ships would not be enough. But he also knew that Churchill wasn't going to let up until something more dramatic was done at Tripoli. And if the Admiral wasn't sure of how to move forward on this, well, his Prime Minister had an idea of how to do that too. It was suggested that if his oldest battleship, the HMS Barham, and perhaps one of his C-class cruisers could be sunk at the entrance of the harbor at Tripoli, the objective would be reached. The Admiral admitted that as these ships were already operating in the area, their chances of reaching Tripoli, only to be sunk there, were better. But the Admiral, probably just like Churchill when he was first sea lord, 
turned his nose up at this idea of losing a ship, not during battle. The compromise was a direct naval attack on the port's facilities. Disguised as a normal convoy run, the attacking ships then broke away and reached the Italian port during the early hours of April 21st. And when the attack commenced, it seemed about to become another Taranto. The Italians were completely surprised, so didn't even fire back for the first 20 minutes, but then only shot straight up into the air as they believed it was a bombing raid. Yet the British, despite the 500 rounds of 15-inch shells and over a 1,000 of smaller shells, didn't cause the amount of destruction they hoped for. Smoke from the burning oil tanks quickly clouded the sky, and so fire correction procedures were not implemented. The Italians, besides having to clean up the mess, found themselves back to work after only 24 hours of repairs. But before Churchill could castigate anyone over the results, which took time to compile, Captain Mack scored a victory that warmed even the cockles of Winston's heart. During a dusk sortie, an air patrol had spotted a large Axis convoy near the Tunisian coast, and so alerted, Mack's destroyers sank five merchantmen and three of its escorting destroyers. So now, the argument of how Rommel should be strangled came down to, do we launch another night raid, which is what Churchill wanted, or use more air patrols to find the damn ships resupplying the Africa Corps, which is what Cunningham wanted to see happen. Sadly, neither man got what they wanted, as the British-led Anzac forces were pushed off the Greek mainland, and thus every ship possible was needed to ferry the men to Crete, or Alexandria. And it was this very pulling away of British naval might at this time that allowed the 15th Panzer Division to arrive safely at Tripoli. Wavell did not hesitate to inform Churchill, I have just received disquieting intelligence. I was expecting another German colonial division. I have just been informed that latest evidence indicates armored, repeat, armored division. I will cable again when I have digested this unwelcome news. The CNC's tone is understandable, but it was not echoed by Churchill. He simply saw the facts, that as Wavell only had a mixture of 30 cruiser and I-tanks at Tobruk and 18 more cruisers along his front near Solom, he simply needed more tanks, and straight away, It was nice that the British workshops on the Naya Delta could repair enough tanks to give Wavell another 35 tanks or so in about six weeks. But still, that was as nothing compared to what Rommel had to hand and what he was about to receive. Namely, 90 medium tanks already in North Africa, the remainder of what the 5th Panzer Division had brought, and now 138 more tanks of the 15th Panzer Division. As Wavell digested, Churchill acted, well, with his pen, but that was his weapon as Prime Minister. And what he envisioned was another Operation Apology, namely sending a large shipment of tanks to Wavell and getting them there ASAP by selling them right past the Straits of Gibraltar and through the Mediterranean, phi on all Axis planes, ships, and submarines. Of course, the reaction to this idea by the Admiralty, by C&C Home Forces, General Sir Alan Brooke, who finally had a few tanks to hit back should the channel be crossed, by the War Office, who had to organize this from the beginning to end, was, uh... But Churchill would not be gainsaid. He made this operation his sole purpose. Wavell would have his 300 tanks, but what's more, there would be as many hurricane fighters on board the five merchant ships as could fit. Operation Tiger, the name of this convoy, would take place. These tanks, or Tiger Cubs, as Winston referred to them, would be put in the hands of the regiments of Krieg's 7th Armored Division that had been, well, tankless since their victory at Betafam, which was indirectly, due to Churchill and his desire 
to assist the Greeks. On the receiving end of Tiger, Wavell was planning his next offensive. It was codenamed Battle Axe, and was to not only duplicate the success of Operation Compass, but if everything went well, exceed it. As Winston was bending the universe to his will that his Tiger Cubs be sent to Alexandria, Hitler was equally consumed with bringing his considerable talents and energy to launching his attack on Russia, on Stalin, with as much German might and the number of men and tanks as possible, and as quickly as possible. The Greek affair had been successful, but now there were six less weeks before winter came. There was also to be fewer men and tanks that had either been destroyed in Greece or that would now have to remain behind to keep the British out. Hitler was just as disinterested as General Halder in the idea of sending Rommel any more armor, despite his appreciation of the man's willingness to fight. Then in stepped Field Marshal von Braulich with his proposal that his Deputy Chief of Staff, General von Paulus, be sent to Libya to judge Rommel's actions thus far and his worthiness of more material and, quite frankly, his chances of success. This was far better than a flat-out no, not that the Desert Fox had a say in the matter. General Paulus arrived, arrogant with power, over the young commander of the Africa Corps on April 26th. What he didn't know was that, a year and a half from now, he, Paulus, would be doing the unthinkable surrendering the 6th German Army at Stalingrad. Rommel had been busy preparing his, hopefully, decisive attack of Tobruk since his failed attempts in mid-April. But Paulus put a stop to everything until he could assess for himself the overall situation and Rommel's plans. Italian General Garibaldi also flew in and walked alongside Paulus. But it wasn't long before the ranking general had to acknowledge that it would not be best to wait for the men of the 5th Light Division to complete their training, or to delay until the armor elements of the 15th Panzer Division were well established at their new home. Each day that went by, the Australians and the British made Tobruk that much stronger, as supplies were still coming in, thanks to the Royal Navy ferrying in war material. Besides which, now that Rommel had the infantry and sapper units of the 15th Panzer with him, having nagged until they were flown in, he felt that the last part of the puzzle of success was in place. General Halder, back home, being sent reports, could not disagree that Rommel's chances of success, on paper, looked good. But the soldiers of Nazi Germany were about to find out that the Australians did not dread battle. They had a job to do and were well prepared to do it. The same thing can be said of Wavell in the not-too-distant future in regards to the professional German soldiers when battle acts commenced. So, with Halder's, and therefore Berlin's blessing, given on April 30th, Rommel got on with his attack of Tobruk. His plan was to pierce the defensive perimeter on its western side, on the night of April 30th, May 1st, along the low rise at Ross, Medar, take out the largest sub-camp in the area, and then dash for the harbor. To soften up the defenses during the day of April 30th, those Australian units at Ross, Medar, were shelled throughout the day, as well as bombed by the Luftwaffe. German experience from Poland and France had shown the aggressors that by the time they launched their attack, the defenders would be too frazzled to resist. The attack came on at 8 p.m. that night. Panzers with grappling hooks approached the bob wire fence, snagged it, and with their hooks pulled a large section clear. Then, tanks from the 5th Panzer and infantry from the 2nd Machine Gun Battalion poured through the opening. Opposing them were men from the 24th Battalion, of the 26th Australian Infantry Brigade. These men at Post 1 for Post 1 of Salient Hill were soon overrun, after four were killed and three were injured. After that, Lieutenant Walker felt it was justified in surrendering. 
Rommel's plan was to penetrate about two miles deep from this point, make for Fort Pilastrino, secure that, and then proceed to the main harbor itself. Meanwhile, Italian units would come forward, hold open the breach, even widening it if possible. But if things truly went well, if the Aussies started falling back, then begin to roll up both flanks. Next, the German tanks approached S-2. It fell as well due to tank fire and German infantry riding atop the approaching tanks and lobbing grenades. Other posts to the right of this breach fell as well, though they managed to take out a few German tanks before capitulating. Still, so far, Rommel's plan was unfolding as expected. The situation more or less settled down during the night. The ancient philosophers said that true happiness comes from within. Well, obviously, they never played Best Fiends. This free-to-download game has it all. Fun characters, new challenges, and thousands of puzzles to play. Whenever I have a few minutes, I bring it up, and I carry on with my quest to get to level 1000 before my wife does. The competition in our house is fierce, more fiendish, and bragging rights are everything. I'm currently on level 87, so I have a ways to go, but that's part of the fun. The gathering of cute characters is my fave by far. I love the artwork. And you can play Best Fiends without an internet connection once you download it. And know that every win brings new challenges and new in-game events are added all the time. So let enough is never enough be your mantra. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. At dawn of May 1st, other posts also fell, but some did not, or inflicted impressive German or Italian casualties before they did. By midday, the breach of the perimeter was about 3 miles or 4.8 kilometers wide. To the left of the breach came the other tanks of the 5th Light Division. To the right, more of the newly, and I mean newly, arrived 15th Panzer Division. The situation was now this. Of the penetrated area, the Axis had taken 15 posts so far, but not all of them. So the attacking tanks and infantry had to be wary as they penetrated deeper into still-held Allied territory. But General Morrishead had planned for this. After all, this was the same area Rommel had hit earlier in the month and seemed to think his chances were best here. So behind the group of outposts was a minefield, and behind that were guns manned by British soldiers, as well as Aussie reinforcements, rushed forward by Moorhead. So the attacks had broke through the perimeter, but they were soon contained and had paid a heavy price in men and material just to get there. That evening of May 1st, the Luftwaffe continued to bomb the Australians, who somehow simply ignored this as their signal. To surrender. The British then threw in their seven cruiser tanks, as well as five Matilda, or heavy infantry tanks, into the contested area in front of the minefield. This helped cause the German advance to become muddled. As for the Italians, who were assigned to hold the perimeter open, the last thing Rommel needed was a repeat of the 16th, when his men and tanks made it in, only to be sealed off from retreat or reinforcements. They gave way to British artillery and Aussie rifle fire and fell back. Rommel, disgusted, decided to use his own men to hold open the perimeter, but that meant he had less men to keep on pressing forward towards Fort Pilastrino. Not that the fort was reached due to those few remaining Australian outposts, the minefield, and the British guns and tanks. At the end of May 1st, Rommel only had about 35 of the 81 tanks he sent in that morning. What's more, his infantry, German and Italian, had suffered tremendously. General Paulus could not help but notice this. The Australians had then tried their own counterattack after checking Rommel, but this was repulsed with heavy casualties. Yet it did confound the Germans, 
who heretofore were used to their opponents surrendering at this stage of the fight. May 2nd saw sandstorms rise and caused a confused attack to become that much more mired. The next day, both sides amassed men and tanks and came at each other. Yet the defenders could not dislodge the attackers, and the attackers could not penetrate the minefield. It became and stayed a bloody stalemate that saw both sides lose many men and have others taken prisoner. By the early hours of May 4th, Paulus ordered Rommel to back off. The assault, under his orders, was to become a siege. Tobruk was to be surrounded and checked. What's more, Rommel's most forward position at Solom was to be reinforced, but with defense in mind. Until the shipping situation could be improved along his supply route, until Rommel's shortages of ammo, petrol, food, and vehicles could be overcome, until Rommel could be sent more medium artillery and more anti-tank units, his days of dashing east were over. Paulus' report to Berlin ended with, By overstepping his orders, Rommel has brought about a situation for which our present supply capabilities are insufficient. The fighting of the last few days would be remembered as the Battle of the Salient. Meanwhile, Churchill, not unexpectedly, all but crowed. To General Morrishead he wrote, The whole empire is watching your steadfast and spirited defense of this important outpost of Egypt with gratitude and admiration. Yet this tale was far from over. Turns out General Paulus's report to Berlin was picked up and decoded by the British. After reading it, Winston dashed off a message to Wavell that basically said, It seems that Rommel is barely holding on to his own and needs the 15th Panzer Division just to maintain what he has, and not, as we feared, advance again. So tell me, are you ready to attack? To which Wavell did not hesitate in replying. I at once ordered Krieg to visit Bearsford Pierce and discuss possibility of using all available tanks for offensive operations. I have already ordered issues for offensive in Western Desert at earliest possible, on assumption Tiger successful. But just to remind his Prime Minister that there was much more on his plate, Wavell also noted the following. Iraq commitment is worrying me more than anything at present, and I have gravest doubts about this and about its effect on Egypt and Palestine. Crete, Cyprus, and Syria are also potential dangers. But now it was clear to those in the know that Churchill already saw Rommel as his personal enemy, as much as he would come to admire the Desert Fox, and thus developed tunnel vision. But the C&C Middle East still had other theaters as his responsibility. Thus ended the second major battle for Tobruk. The enemy had broken into a perimeter on a front of nearly three miles and a depth of just less than two. It had gained a good observation point and a possible jumping-off place for a future attack. This had cost the Germans about 650 casualties and the Italians some 500. Although General Paulus referred to it as an important success, he directed that the attack was not to be renewed unless the enemy left to Brook of his own accord. The principal task now for the Deutsche Afrika Corps was to hold Cyrenaica, regardless of who held Solom, Bardia, or even Tobruk. Breathing space was needed. Operation Barbarossa was about to commence. For the present, the troops were to be disposed in depth around Tobruk, and a defensive line was to be prepared on the eastern edge of the Jebel Akdar, with its left at Gazala and its right going well into the desert. Epilogue. Churchill, using the stroke of his pen and the force of his personality, overrode all opposition and got Operation Tiger going. What's more, it would turn at Gibraltar and make its way directly through the Mediterranean. And this was despite the fact that the now thoroughly professional Luftwaffe was operating in the area. 
The question wasn't, would all the ships make it through, but rather, how many would be lost? But, be it luck, fate, chance, or what you will, Tiger's losses were smaller than many would have bet on. Yes, one merchant ship was lost, another had been damaged by mines. Not to mention the destroyer, the Fortune, was hit by a bomb. But when the convoy arrived early on May 12th at Alexandria, Wavell, Krieg, and the Desert Rats now had 238 out of the 295 tanks sent to them. There was also the bonus of 43 out of the 53 hurricanes making it as well. Operation Battle Axe was coming together. Iraq. A little backstory first. Iraq, a former Turkish province, was the first country to become independent after the First World War, and being a newly independent country, she needed allies. So a treaty of alliance and mutual support was signed with Great Britain in 1930. If war came, Iraq was to give all possible help, which included the right-of-way at airports, waterways, and railways. But even in peace, the British had the right of passage. By the end of 1937, there were no British infantry in Iraq. Yet the RAF was allowed to maintain its airbase at Chiapa, near Basra, and at Habaniya, along the Euphrates. These were needed as stopping points between Egypt and India. As for security, Iraqi soldiers were responsible as they also guarded the vital oil pipelines that ran from the northern part of their country to Haffa in Palestine and Syria. When war came to Europe, the king of Iraq was only a four-year-old boy. It was his uncle, Amir Abdul Ila, who was regent, and fortunately for the Allies, pro-British. Soon, official ties with Nazi Germany were broken, but not with Italy. Naturally, the Axis Union used this connection to build a case for themselves and against the British. Germany's string of victories throughout 39 and 40 did not hurt this endeavor in the least. Now, long before the war, India and Britain had a long-running understanding. In case of war, India would provide one division, and the thinking was it would be used to protect the Anglo-Iranian oil fields. By the time the Battle of Britain was intensifying, in July of 1940, the War Cabinet wanted a brigade of that promised division sent to Basra to repel attacks against the oil lines. But Wavell believed that sending them there in mid-1940, before that area was even being contested, would raise local tensions and make the British look weak. Eventually, London agreed, and instead that brigade went to the Sudan, to help deal with the Italians who were attempting to rebuild the Roman Empire. We have already seen how that turned out. But by September of 1940, tensions were rising in Iraq anyway, and they were felt all the way back to the Thames. The regent might have been pro-British, but many of the offices under him, like the Prime Minister Rashad Ali El Galani and others, were either pro-Italian or pro-German. What's more, as Germany racked up victory after victory, many of Iraq's officers started leaning towards Berlin. This kind of thing is natural in military men. To all this, London decided on, instead of rattling their saber, to send a diplomatic embassage with the ability to grant concessions, i.e. grease palms that needed greasing, and only to just show the hilt of their sword. Yet, for whatever reason, the mission was never sent. Those that needed to be placated, bribed, or threatened never were. In fact, the new ambassador, Sir Cornwallis, was not even sent out until early April 1941. By then, the lines were hardening, and those anti-British elements were thinking that stronger Iraqi leadership was needed, and that they would take strong methods to make that happen which brought forth greater tension and talk of civil war. The Prime Minister, Rashad Ali, began to feel the pressure from the British and resigned his office, but he was replaced by a pan-Arab, 
This was not a step forward for the United Kingdom. During all this, and right after, Wavell continued insane, especially in March of 41. If anything happens, let the CNC in India handle it. He was currently busy at the moment, and London agreed. But all this talking and planning what to do, if something happened, amounted to nothing being done at all. So the Iraqi officer corps and certain high-ranking officials not only kept channels open with Italy and therefore Germany, but threatened to remove the pan-Arab leader who fled the country on the last day of March and left Baghdad for Habaniya, where he was protected by the British. This left his office completely open, but not for long, as Rashid Ali stepped in, backed by the Golden Square, four important Army and Air Force officers. Word was sent out that Ali was now the head of the National Defense Government. The question before London now was, do we recognize Ali, and what are his intentions? There weren't that many troops to hand in the area, and Wavell was quite busy with Rommel in North Africa. Still, Churchill wanted to know his military options. The Viceroy of India promised one infantry brigade group to be followed by more once shipping was available. London said, thank you, but Wavell replied, I hope you're not going to ask me, because I can't give you anything. What I have is trying to protect Egypt from the surging German and Italian forces. So try the diplomatic stuff again. But it was too late for that. The RAF in Iraq, under Air Vice Marshal H.G. Smart, had 78 aircraft, and all but four were obsolete. Yet that wasn't the issue. The issue was, did the Iraqi government see those planes as theirs? or the law be damned, did they have plans on taking them and add them to their own obsolete air force? After all, there is a certain power in numbers. No, the planes represented power. Who had the power within the Iraqi government, and who especially had the power on the ground? The men of the RAF had the feeling they were about to find out. As for the British politicians, their questions centered around Would Baghdad honor all previous agreements, and would the United Kingdom be allowed to keep armed forces in the country to protect their interests? The answers from Rashid Ali seemed to be, perhaps, maybe, and not on your life. The new British ambassador, Cern Corwallis, sent out word to Rashid Ali that Britain was going to use the Treaty of Passage to send troops to Palestine. The response was silence. So, British-led units started arriving. Elements of the 20th Indian Infantry Brigade were soon in country. But what's more, the headquarters of the 10th Indian Division, under Major General Fraser, also showed up, as he took command of all armed forces in Iraq. Ali's reaction to this was, All right, they're here. Get them out ASAP, and no other forces are allowed to enter until all these are gone. The new Iraqi leader had not quite grasped the game that was being played on his court. But he certainly did when he was told that more units of the 10th Indian Division would arrive by the end of April. Diplomatically, he said, no. To those of his followers, he said, something has to be done before the Commonwealth forces get even stronger. It was time to fight. Kind of. More like a demonstration. And that demonstration was to be at the RAF station at Habianiya. Habianiya is almost 50 miles west of Baghdad, which itself is overlooked by a plateau. At the station were 1,000 airmen, just over 1,000 Iraqi and Assyrian support staff, and 9,000 locals. The base had everything to be had, but its weakness, in military terms, was its one water tower and single power station. The iron fence around it was seven miles long, and therefore indefensible. However, as tension mounted, Vice Marshal Smart had a few more planes brought in, and all of them now had attached the 250-pound bombs instead of the smaller ones used for training. And they were all live. 
Ammunition and supplies had been built up, and security was tightened. Basically, the British were gearing up for war, as the Iraqis were planning for war. Two very different things. By the end of April, most of the British women and children had been evacuated. Of Iraq's four divisions, two were kept near Baghdad, and during the opening hours of April 30th, elements of them were spotted en route to the British-held airfield. A few hours later, at least two Iraqi battalions were on the plateau, and only then did an Iraqi officer deliver a message to the airbase. All flights were to stop immediately, and no one was allowed to leave or enter the base, to which the ranking man, the air officer commanding, replied, any forced alteration to the base's routine would be considered an act of war. This gave pause to the local officer. Later that same morning, the Iraqi envoy returned, saying Britain had violated the treaty, to which, and rightfully so, the ranking airbase officer said that was a concern for the politicians. They were soldiers. The British officer then contacted Air Vice Marshal Smart by wireless. Smart considered the situation. The Iraqis were just outside his base and were growing in strength. They could be waiting for darkness to attack, knowing the planes would then be useless. And there were no reinforcements in the area. Yet Wavell's theme had always been, don't cause a problem, just react and buy time. So, as the sun crossed the sky, Smart decided to wait and see what their potential enemy did. This decision paid off. The forces on the plateau continued to build, but did not attack. Smart arranged to have more planes sent to the base. Again, they were obsolete Wellingtons, but they would be more than effective against the opposing force. Communications continued to go back and forth between the base commander and Smart, between the British ambassador and the Iraqi government, and between the threatening force and whoever was controlling it. As for the messages between the British ambassador and London, the ambassador said he believed they were already at war, and having Iraqi troops just outside the airbase was intolerable. Besides, it was only a matter of time before they attacked. The foreign office replied, Do what you think best to safeguard the troops and bring order to the situation, by whatever means. This reply came to the ambassador on May 1st. So, Air Vice Marshal Smart decided to make the first move and attack the threatening Iraqi forces without warning. No reason to give those forces a chance to shell his planes before the attack. Those planes were his only real weapon. So, on the very next day, May 2nd, the Habaniya Air Base had 33 of its planes in the air, ready to attack. They were joined by eight Wellingtons from Shaiba. At 5 a.m., the bombing runs started. The Iraqis, in response, immediately started shelling the base, taking out a few planes being worked on. Before too long, aircraft from the Iraqi Air Force joined in, and as their pilots had more experience, were able to take out five British planes. It must be remembered, Habaniya was a training airbase. As for those on the base, there were casualties, military and civilian personnel. But the RAF suffered two more planes lost from another squadron in their attempt to take out railways leading to the capital. By dusk, the Habaniya airbase took account of itself. As tragic as their losses were, They weren't horrendous, and certainly did not impair the functioning of the base. Therefore, the base commander decided to hit the threatening forces, vehicles, and other Iraqi infrastructure. But now, it was the British ambassador's turn to come under attack, in a way that potentially could adversely affect the entire British war effort in Iraq. Local officials forced their way into the British legation and disassembled his wireless set. His last message to go out asked the airbase to keep him up to date on events by dropping reports over the compound. He also stated that about 350 British civilians had just come to the embassy for protection. Supplemental
although I've never said anything about it. Did you ever wonder why the British were able to move about, to actually thrive in the desert, whereas the Italians always seemed to be fighting it, and Rommel had to slowly learn the ways of the desert only after arriving in North Africa? The answer is quite simple. Ralph Bagnold. A veteran of the First World War, Bagnold studied engineering at Cambridge and then went back to active duty in 1921. Spending time in Cairo and the northwest frontier of India, Bagnold fell in love with the desert, which he learned had its own set of rules. Whenever he could, the man would disappear into the sands, finding its quiet suited him. In 1929, with like-minded friends and colleagues, Bagnold, traversing in a Ford Model A, along with two Ford lorries, traveled from Cairo to Ain Dalla, almost to the Libyan border, and not along the well-used coast road, but through the sands. Finding himself and the life he wanted to explore, he left the army in 1935. That same year, Bagnold came out with his book, Libyan Sands, Travels in a Dead World. Yes, the desert was harsh, the sun unsympathetic, but one had to learn to live within its ways. During his time in the 30s, he developed the sun compass, which, unlike the magnetic compass, wasn't influenced by the large iron ore deposits throughout the desert. He also realized, much like certain parts of the world do when their roads are covered with snow, that there were advantages to releasing some of the air out of the tires to help with traction. With the outbreak of World War II, Bagnold signed up again, under the colors of his country. But this time, he had something singular to offer his superiors. In June of 1940, Bagnold secured permission, unlike David Sterling of the SAS, who stole his way into Wavell's office, to see the CNC and put before him his idea of a group of men that would execute long-range reconnaissance patrols behind enemy lines. And Wavell, feeling pressure from Churchill to always be on the offensive, saw the potential of peeking at the cards in the other guy's hands and agreed. The formation, first known as the Number 1 Long Range Patrol Unit, LRP, came to life a month later, in July of 1940. With two officers and 85 other various positions, they all made for the desert to learn what Bagnall knew by his years in the element. The men were broken down into six or so patrols that could act independently, as they each had their own navigator, medic, radio operator, and mechanic. In time, each man would learn a bit of the other's job, thereby increasing the effectiveness of each patrol, even during losses through combat or illness. Before the end of the year, 1940, the LRP was reorganized into the Long Range Desert Group with six larger patrols. Counterintuitively, the vehicles they used were mainly two-wheel drive as opposed to four-wheel drives because they used more fuel. Also, to make the Chevrolets or Canadian trucks lighter, all doors, windscreens, and roofs were removed. What's more, they also had larger radiators installed, along with a condenser system and leaf springs to help with the mostly uneven terrain. Finishing them off, each vehicle had a sun compass, designed by Bagnall. During the course of the war, the trucks used by the LRDG went from Fords to Chevrolets, back to Fords, but finished the war with Willys Jeeps. Although Bagnold stressed the non-combative role of the LRDG, their vehicles were well-armed, eventually using Vickers anti-tank guns mounted at the rear. But as the years went by during the war, the guns were upgraded to deliver power and speed of fire. The one weak point of the LRDG wasn't their fault. At the outbreak of war, everyone had to use Italian maps, since that country had been dominant in the area since the mid-1930s. It would take time for the British to create their own maps using aerial photography. So, until then, their watches, which were checked every night, in conjunction with the stars above them, guided these eyes and ears of the British armies 
in North Africa. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So uh, I just want to take a moment and say hi to some members, thank some people, um, and some other things. And then I have a very funny story to tell you. So if you're driving, just uh, just be careful, okay? So first of all, I'd like to say hello to my new members, uh, Peter R. from Lake Oswego, Oregon, Sal D. Giovanni from Charlotte, North Carolina. He spelled it out, so I wanted to make sure I got that right. Um, Celeste B. Sorry, Celeste, I'm not sure where you're from. Alan S. Um, Stephen B. from Salt Lake City, Utah. Patricia K. from Mission Viejo, California. Roy D. from Seattle, Washington. And David D. from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, as far as people who made donations, Tim H. from Greenwich, Connecticut. Thank you. And Alan W., I believe, from Barcelona, Spain. So thank you very much. And last but not least, I'd like to thank John B. from La Quinta, California, who bought a CD, The Battle of Britain Part 1. And I will be coming out, just to make it easier for everybody, I'm going to be coming out soon, and it will be on the website, worldwar2podcast.net, where you can get the entire Churchill collection, hopefully on one disc or two, but it's going to be all together one unit. You don't have to buy Part 1 and Part 2. It's all going to be put together. And so I'll have that available in the next couple of weeks. Just got to get together with Paul, my uh, tech guru. And also, please allow me to ask um, that you check out my sponsor, lynda.com. The more of you that sign up for that and get your free 10-day trial, the longer they're going to keep me around so I can uh, get closer and closer to being able to do this full-time and put out a lot more episodes a lot more frequently. Also, uh, as some of you may know, I'm doing other podcasts now. So if you're interested in a uh, coffee mug uh, with Churchill, FDR, Caesar, or Alexander the Great, just write me and let me know. I'll be happy to tell you all about them and show you pictures and stuff like that. You can just email me at wwiipodcast at gmail.com. And of course, don't forget Audible. Um, even though I don't have anything to recommend, they're they're kind of light on Rommel, Patent, uh, Wavel, Middle East, uh, North Africa, Desert Rats kind of thing. So it's kind of uh, not too happy with that, but just if you see if you're if there's anything you want to get on Audible, just please consider going through the website. So uh, so I get a commission from that. I really would appreciate it. Okay, so here's how my 2014 ended, and I'm going to try and do this justice. Uh, a couple of days after Christmas, one of my coworkers played a prank on me. I work at a, a head and neck cancer um, clinic, so things are pretty tense there. We try to we try to mess with each other just to keep it loose. And someone got me a gift of a very nice wrapping, but you open it up and there was some very real looking dog poo in there. So I'm thinking, okay, haha, very funny. Now, during the Christmas New Year break for two weeks, my wife has been dreadfully sick. You know, the temperature, the everything stopped up, the pain and the misery. And instead of just going home and just telling her about this prank um, and hopefully getting her to laugh, I decide to use it on her. Yes. I am not a very good husband. So I go home, bring, bring, bring the fake poo home, and I put it into a room, and I walk out, and I pretend to walk in a couple minutes later, and I just explode into really bad language. What is going on here? The dog has pooped all over the floor. Oh my God. And my wife comes in, who's, you know, 101 temperature. I'll get it. No, no, honey. I'll do this. You, you're, you're sick. You're not feeling good. I will clean this up. I will take care of it. So she goes back to her chair, and I pretend that I'm in there cleaning and scrubbing and saying a whole bunch of bad words. And I finally get it all up. And then uh, 30 minutes later, I put the fake dog poo in another room. And again, I repeat myself. I explode. Uh, she comes in there. I'm, no, honey, I will get this. Everything's fine. And she's really starting to get angry. She's very, she's very weak. She's semi-delirious. And she's threatening a whole, a whole bunch of horrible things to do to this dog. And I'm thinking, okay, this is getting out of hand. I have to stop. But obviously, um, there's something wrong with me because I don't tell her what I was doing. I think at this point, I'm too afraid. So at this point, she tells me that I have a package, a box from the UK. So I go in there, and there is a very lovely package from Ross Minton, who has sent me basically a British care package. Everything that all you people over there can buy in the stores that obviously I can't. Um, he sent me this whole back box of stuff, and it was just super sweet of him. I just really thank you. But here's the problem. I think the box might have been dropped a couple hundred times. Um, it was completely shattered. And what the mail carrier had done was basically just throw the box, and it's in whatever shape, into a larger plastic bag and tied it up. 
So um, I, I go into my bedroom. It's, it's, it's on the floor. I pick it up. I put it on my bed and I open up the bag and it's got all these neat things. And it's got this really nice, sweet letter from him. Thank you. Um, and but inside the package, one of the items had broken because this box truly was destroyed. And Everything inside the box and the inside of the box is covered in a brown substance. And in the, in the letter in my hand is covered in a brown substance. It's still, it's still legible, but it just looks not good. And the wife comes stumbling in and she looks at me and she looks at the box and she looks at all the brown covered all over the box. And what I had done was I had taken the fake poo and I'd put it on the bed. I just, I didn't think anything about it. I just put it on the bed to the side and I'm sitting there trying to read this letter through the brown haze. And uh, the wife walks in and she sees this box covered. She sees the poo on the bed and she (laughs) screams to the point where she loses her voice for the next half day. I'm going to kill that dog. He pooped all over your care package. Oh my God, he pooped on the bed. She starts screaming, going to chase out the dog. And she's a, she's a wonderful, wonderful, kind, sweet, gentle soul who is about to kill this dog. So I literally have to run while I'm laughing because I'm not a very nice husband. I literally have to run and semi-tackle her before she gets to the dog. He's not very big. He's not going to make it more than two or three seconds when she gets her hands on him. So I pretty much have to tackle her somehow explain the situation to her and I can just watch her start to calm down and then get angry all over again. But this time it's at me. It's not directed at the dog. So maybe I should have let her kill the dog. But anyway, so I did sleep in another room that night, but it was totally worth it. And Ross, I just want to say thank you. Besides the the bottle that broke, uh, it was just really neat getting all that stuff because I'm a huge uh, fan, uh, Anglophile, if you will. And I just can't wait to, uh, to get over to London one day, to get over to Britain either, um, and may hopefully Scotland to see Paul, but I am trying everything I can to get over there, and uh, I just really appreciated it more um, than you'll ever know, and why I used it to torture my sick wife, it's just because I'm a messed up human being, so um, that's, how my, that's how my year ended, so thank you very much, uh, the rest of it was awesome, it was salvageable, I hope you guys have a um, great new year. And I have decided on my little um, in-between series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do two really big episodes per month uh, per my agreement with Linda. But I've also decided on a little independent mini-series. I've decided on the subject of that. So that will start popping out in between it just to give you something to listen to. Uh, It will be available to everybody. It's not a membership or anything like that. And so that'll be coming out soon. So I hope you enjoy that. Um, And so I'll just get back to work doing doing what I do. Um, Thank you for everybody who was a member who who supported me, for the people that follow me on Facebook, you've bought coffee mugs, whatever. I just want to say thank you very much. And and I will uh, see you as soon as I can with episode 118. Take care, everyone.